There we go. All right. So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jimena. I am the New York Outreach Coordinator for the Long Island Sound Study. Um, and today I'm joined by my colleagues and experts from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, Casey Personius and Vicki O'Neill. They're gonna be um, helping to answer questions throughout the webinar uh, in the chat box. And um, at the end of the presentation, you'll have a chance to um, have a Q&A with us um, about what you've seen today. So um, I wanna thank you for being here. Uh, Estuary Day is something that we usually uh, coordinate with the other two estuary programs in Long Island, the Peconic Estuary Partnership and the South Shore Estuary Reserve. And usually we would be out on a beautiful shorefront and having lots of fun activities. Um, so, so this year that's not the case and we've gone digital, but we're very thankful that you're here with us today. So before uh, we dive in, just a couple of things. Uh, you should notice that uh, this is being recorded. The recording will be available to you after uh, the webinar in a couple of days on our YouTube channel and also on our website. Um, you'll also notice that your video and your mics are turned off. Um, but like I said, if you have any questions or comments or any resources to share, please feel absolutely free to do so uh, by dropping them in the chat. And like I said, Casey and Vicky will be there to answer any questions you may have. And then during the Q&A session, if you would rather voice your question as opposed to type it, you can uh, ask, you can raise your hand to ask be unmuted. Uh, you can do so by clicking the participants button, which should be uh, in the bottom of your screen somewhere um, and hitting uh, raise hand. So first things first, it's estuary day. So what is an estuary? So an estuary is where fresh water from rivers meets with salt water uh, from the ocean. So the sound is a perfect example of this kind of habitat. Um, it, it's uh, once that fresh water and salt water combine, what we have is brackish water. So that's sort of in between water, but it's actually not even uh, in salinity. If you were to test the salinity a little bit closer to the um, uh, closer to the Atlantic around here, it's going to be a little bit saltier than if you tested it right around here or if you tested it um, near to the city, for example. So it's, it's uneven salinity. The salinity also depends on whether it's high tide, whether it's low tide. So this, these ecosystems are really transitional zones. Um, and so uh, partly because of this transitional um, nature of them, they play a really important role uh, in, in nature. One of those roles is that they serve as natural filters. So um, imagine a river, it's coming down um, towards an estuary and it brings with it a whole lot of sediment. And what happens is that a lot of that sediment tends to stay uh, in the estuary, which is why estuary, like the sound, if you think about it, it's, it's a little bit, um, uh, misty, right? So a lot of that sediment stays in the estuary before the water uh, goes out into the ocean. So it serves as a, as a, as a filter in that way. But it's also a filter because uh, estuaries are home oftentimes uh, to salt marshes like the one we see here in the picture. And the, uh, the salt grasses and the peat that is found in these uh, salt marshes help um, absorb and filter a lot of the pollutants and um, heavy metals, pesticides, fer uh, fertilizer from lawns that is carried over from runoff uh, from, where, from when it rains, right? So in that way, it helps uh, maintain the water quality a little bit better before that water from runoff makes it into the greater estuary. Now estuaries are also among the most productive um, ecosystems in the world. Uh, they are more productive uh, in a year than uh, comparably sized forests and even agricultural land. And because of that, they help sustain a wide variety of uh, species. Now in the sound, our estuary is home to more than 1,200 species of invertebrates. Uh, we have about 100 species of fish and dozens of species of migratory birds that, that spend at least a part of their uh, time uh, in the sound. And um, it's very common in estuaries to find species that have adapted to, again, these kind of transitional, uneven um, environments. So oysters, for example, will open and close depending on whether it's high tide or low tide and 
how the salinity is doing. Uh, terrapins are an interesting um, turtle. They, they actually prefer brackish as opposed to freshwater or saltwater. Um, and, um, and we also have pickleweed, which is a succulent, this, uh, this plant we see here at the um, upper center. And it's one of the most salt resistant uh, plants that we see in, in uh, salt marshes in the sound. Uh, the sound is also a stopover site for migratory birds. So uh, as, as, low as low tide, um, excuse me, as the tide lowers and those mud flats become exposed and all of those invertebrates are there, um, migratory birds are able to, to eat as they, um, as they make their way to wherever they are going, right? So uh, estuaries serve as a really useful food source for a number of organisms. And finally, estuaries are also natural nurseries. In fact, uh, the majority of the shellfish and the fish that is consumed in the US um, spend at least a, a, a part of their life cycle in estuaries. So um, an example of that from here in the sound is alewife. The alewife, which uh, is, the, uh, is the little fish that you see right here, um, spends the majority of its life in the ocean. But when it's time to spawn, it swims back into the estuary and it actually finds its way up the same river it, it itself was born. Um, and once it spawns and those juveniles are born, they swim down and they spend uh, some time in the estuary until they're big enough to actually go back uh, to the open ocean. So estuaries are also uh, really important for us, for human beings. In fact, of the 32 largest cities in the world, 22 of them are directly uh, by estuaries, including New York City, right? Um, in the case of the Sound, more than 4 million people live in, in coastal communities around it. Uh, more than 23 million people live within 50 miles of the Sound. And the Sound is estimated to contribute to uh, about $9.4 billion annually to the local economy by uh, through tourism and through fishing and um, shell fishing, uh, cargo ships, etc. Um, so it's a, it's a really uh, an important economic resource as well. And because of all of these reasons that I've already listed, in 1987, Congress designated that the sand was an estuary of national significance. So two years prior to that, Congress established uh, the Long Island Sound Study, which is who I work for. Um, and essentially, uh, the sound study is a partnership between the EPA and different agencies in New York and Connecticut, essentially helping um, coordinate the different environmental efforts happening on the ground to help conserve and restore and, and protect the sound. And this is work that's been going on for 35 years now. So when you think about a healthy estuary, what, thing, what, things, uh, what things come to mind? So the way that we operate is we have four main focuses. Number one is water, right? When you think about a, 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 an estuary, the number one thing is having clean water. So is the, is the seafood safe? Um, is there a lot of marine debris reaching in the water and how do we prevent that from happening? How, is the, um, how are the levels of nutrients that are reaching the water and what green infrastructure uh, can we use to lower those levels and, and take them back to healthy levels, right? So that's number one. Number two is thriving habitats and abundant wildlife. So making sure that the animals and the ecosystems around the estuary are healthy, right? So are those alewives um, able to go up rivers to be able to spawn effectively? Do they have enough um, habitat available to them? How are the horseshoe crabs doing? Um, are, are there invasive species that are taking over habitats that need to be taken care of, to be monitored, et cetera? The third uh, focus is actually people. So the people around the sound, um, are they supported economically by the sound? Are these all of these industries that I mentioned, are the people able to enjoy the beach? Uh, are they aware of what they can do to help out or, or how their behaviors affect the sound? And that is a really important component of the work that we're doing. And finally, 
sound science and inclusive management, which essentially means that we want to make sure that we're up to date with the best technology and science that we can have in order to make the best decisions about what should be prioritized as we move forward in conserving and restoring the sound. And something I want to point out is that one of the pillars in there is citizen science. And like I said, one of the uh, four focuses is people and uh, their involvement and making sure that they know essentially that they know what's up, right? So what can you do? So uh, if you want to get involved, one of the things you can do is volunteer. If you go to our website uh, and go to get involved, <laughs> excuse me, we have uh, the a volunteer opportunities listing. And essentially this list uh, has groups from both New York and Connecticut. It's a pretty extensive list. And it includes volunteering opportunities of different types, whether it be volunteering to help uh, in an office or helping organize events, or whether it's going out on the field and helping monitor uh, wildlife, th there's a number of things going on there. So if you're interested, this is a good place to start. Now, as you might expect with the current pandemic, um, we haven't, it, it's been difficult, right, to have um, as much volunteering as we would like, but beach cleanups have actually been able to continue. It's been one of the activities that's been able to go on. So the American Literal Society is the group that mainly is in charge of uh, organizing the international beach cleanup in New York, and they're actually still uh, recruiting people interested in participating, interested in leading their own uh, beach cleanups. So if you're interested in this, I would encourage you to email Lisa Skepke. Uh, this right here is her email. Um, and I include the Manhasset Bay Protection Committee logo here because uh, if you are in that region, the Manhasset Bay Protection Committee will actually be conducting beach cleanups up until the end of the year. And they have information about uh, doing social distance uh, beach cleanups and they are providing swag to families who participate. So if you're interested in that program, uh, you can email Sarah Deodorine at that email I provided right there. Another way to uh, get involved is to become a citizen scientist, like I said. And there are plenty of opportunities um, around the sun to do this. Two of the main ones I want to highlight is uh, alewife monitoring and horseshoe crab monitoring. Um, alewife monitoring happens mostly in the winter between March and May, and our trainings happen in February and March. And essentially, it's the perfect thing to do uh, in times of social distancing. All you need is one partner, so you can go with someone from your household. And what we have volunteers do is we have them go to specific creeks where we want to know whether those alewives that I mentioned are being able to, to reach uh, the area to spawn. And so uh, volunteers, by participating, are providing a lot of really useful data. And the other um, opportunity we have is horseshoe crab monitoring. This one happens in the summertime around May, June, July. And this is, um, this is to monitor uh, the horseshoe crabs as they come to shore to spawn. And so volunteers are trained to, to take uh, different types of measurements, um, help tag the horseshoe crabs, and help get a better sense of how this, how this pretty fragile population is doing in the sound. And finally, um, I included this because I know I have a, a number of uh, educators and teachers here today. So another way to get involved is if you're an educator is to uh, participate or even lead uh, one of our mentor teacher workshops. So this is something that we organize um, every year we recruit two teams of two teachers and we provide them with the financial uh, resources and, and also um, uh, just help um, to develop their own professional development workshops. Um, and so these workshops are a wealth of information. Um, they are each centered around uh, the topic of their choice, um, but a topic related to the sound and they are meant to share um, hands-on activities that can be used in the classroom. So if any of the things I mentioned today uh, sound interesting to you, or uh, if, if you wanna know more, because there's a lot happening in the, in the watershed, you can feel free to email me. Um, and you can also drop uh, your email in the chat if you would like to be uh, added to either our educator mailing list or our volunteer mailing list so that you can uh, stay on top of 
what's going on, what's going on. And of course, another way to stay involved and know what's going on in the watershed is by following us on the social media platform of your choice. All right, so now we've made it to the tour um, part of our presentation. I'm going to stop sharing and just uh, give me one moment. One moment. All right. Uh, you see my screen, correct? Yes. Yep. Cool. Thanks so much. All right. So before we jump in, uh, well, first of all, hello. I am your tour guide. Thank you so much for being here with us. Please keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle at all times and don't feed the wildlife. They might bite or they might give you ticks with Lyme disease. So um, as you see, there's a lot of pins on this map. Uh, we're not gonna get to all of these. There's, we don't have enough time for that. But this is just to show you some of the um, opportunities available. And also uh, I wanna say that this is not an exhaustive list by any means. But the five that we're going to be uh, talking about today are um, all part of um, our stewardship areas. And so stewardship areas are areas that have been identified by our program as providing exceptional ecological and recreational value. So each of them have uh, something interesting and unique about them. That's something to keep an eye out for um, as you, if you visit them. So let's go ahead and dive in. First off, we have Halleck State Park Preserve. So uh, this park is in Jamesport, New York. Let me click here first and then we'll go to the map. So uh, this park was actually opened relatively recently and um, three years ago. And uh, it's a 225 acre park. It was originally named uh, James, uh, Jamesport State Park, but it, the name was changed to Halleck for the family, the Halleck family who resided there uh, from 1660 all the way to the 1970s. And actually there's a, a, really, a, a really interesting museum just off the entrance to this park uh, that provides a wealth of information about the history of the different historical homes, uh, farming in the region, and the different immigrant families who moved here from Europe. Now, this uh, park, along with Mattituck State uh, and Tidal Wetlands, uh, put together make up one of the stewardship sites that I had mentioned. Now, the New York, uh, excuse me, the New York Her Natural Heritage Program actually has identified 16 ecological communities here, including maritime bluffs, coastal woodlands, and, and small wetlands. So uh, the park is open for hiking, for nature walks, and for bird watching. Um, it has two main trails at the moment. Uh, since August, only one of them is open, but it's the one that heads to the beach, that, this one that we're seeing. Uh, so I would encourage you to check the website for updates on that. Uh, but it's a, it's a very beautiful park. It's got about one mile of beachfront, as you see here. Um, here's a here's another view of it. The park is open Wednesday through Sunday and if you go to the website there is a downloadable trail guide uh, that kind of walks you through certain parts of the park and tells you what wildlife you can look out for there, um, and what projects have been going on, etc. Uh, and something that's pretty unique about uh, this park is that it has hoodoos or hoodoo-like formations. Now if you're familiar with the Hoodoos in, in Utah, this, this, these are slightly different, but essentially these are really rare um, geological formations that are caused uh, by erosion happening for thousands of years. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty cool that we have them here in Long Island. So just to show you here on the map, here's the museum I mentioned, the Hallockville Museum Farm. And uh, you'll see that this is not quite up to date. This, this map, uh, it looks it was still under construction, but this is now what the nature center is. And you drive through here and the park is actually right back here. 
and you see it right there. You would park there. So up next we have Comset State, Histor State Historic Park Preserve. Um, so I'm gonna show you a little video I have here first. All right, so here's the preserve from above. This preserve is actually um, nearly uh, 1,500 acres big. Um, and in 1921, it was purchased by Marshall Field Park III, who's the, he was the heir to the Marshall Field Department Store Fortune. Um, and the preserve really wasn't what it was today when he purchased it. There were a couple of abandoned farms and things like that. So he employed a number of people, among them um, John Russell Pope, who's the architect who also designed uh, the Jefferson Memorial in DC. Um, and so they, they made this what it is. Um, Field was also the one who officially gave the name Comset to the region. Comset was uh, the name used by the, the Matinecock Native Americans who lived here in the 1600s, and it means a uh, place by a sharp rock. So let's go back here. So there are actually a really huge uh, variety of different ecosystems in this park. There's uh, dunes, open meadows, forests, salt marsh, uh, freshwater ponds. And because of that variety, it's a really uh, useful resource scientifically um, and culturally as well. It's also home to the largest and most diverse coastal forests in the North Shore of Long Island. It also houses uh, native grassland, which is one of the habitats that's, that's uh, close, um, quickly, excuse me, quickly disappearing in Long Island. So in 2010, uh, the Compsit Foundation, along with the New York Parks uh, Regional Environmental Office, uh, were able to begin this grassland restoration project, thanks in part to funding from uh, the Long Island Sound Study Futures Fund. Um, and the idea was to remove some invasive plants that were here and uh, replace them with grassland and wildflower. So what's interesting is that uh, these grasslands are uh, the first confirmed breeding site in Long Island of the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. Now, these butterflies hadn't been seen in Long Island for a very long time. It was kind of, it, it was very rare to see them here. And uh, one day this big population was found in the park. And the, the, the hypothesis is that they might have actually been uh, brought by the wind from Connecticut, from populations in Connecticut, because the, the closest point between Connecticut and Comset is just about five and a half miles. So that's an interesting little tidbit there. Uh, this park is also considered um, an important coastal fish and wildlife habitat. And there are a number of endangered birds that have been seen here, including osprey and piping plover and even bald eagles. So for those of you who are bird, and bird enthusiasts, uh, you can go to the Comset Foundation and they have uh, this, this cool uh, birding guide. It's actually bigger than this, um, but it tells you what species to look out for in the different seasons. And they actually also host um, bird watching events. Just last week there was one um, happening. So uh, with that, we can do a little bit of a dive here just to see what it looks like. And this is um, right in front of the estate. You see the sand right there. There's a little pond. This one, uh, it looks like it was taken in the, in the fall at some point, this picture. But right here we see the Marshall Field Estate. It's pretty nice. So up next we have the Marshlands Conservancy in Rye, New York right over here. So we're gonna go here first. Now this is a 151 acre wildlife sanctuary and it's pretty significant both ecologically and uh, historically as I'm gonna explain further in a little bit. Um, but this part is, uh, it's part of the Boston Post Road National Historic Landmark District, which is quite a mouthful. So I might just call it the Landmark District for now <laughs> for the purposes of this presentation. Um, but uh, this is actually considered an archaeologically sensitive zone um, 
because there have been a lot of digs here and a lot of uh, different artifacts have been found um, providing evidence that, um, that there might have been paleo, uh, paleo Native Americans in the region. Um, and the Martians Conservancy itself is also the largest tidal marsh system in Westchester. Now, there are five ecosystems that make up um, this park. We have meadows, forests, um, salt marsh, beach, and uh, freshwater ponds. And what's interesting is that as you go to these trails and walk them, you are able to see the different gradients of these ecosystems. So in that way, um, it's a very interesting educational opportunity. Um, and if you are interested in tours, you can go to the Westchester um, website and I believe they provide tours to up to uh, 30 people uh, on a variety of different topics. So that's a, a cool little resource they have there. And the presence of these ecosystems is also um, a haven for local birds, which is why um, this was also called um, an important bird area by the nature, um, excuse me, the Nos National Audubon uh, Society. So, like I said, this is a very historical area and part of what they've done uh, to keep it pristine and peaceful is that uh, no motorized ground tools are allowed to be used in the area. So it's very quiet. So it's not surprising then that actually a lot of hikers and, and people who go walking there often report wildlife sightings. So I actually took these pictures directly from All Trails website, which is um, where uh, hikers go to talk about their experiences. And, and it's very common to see uh, wildlife like this one there. So uh, here again, we see the mudflats that I had mentioned earlier at low tide. This is full of invertebrates to help sustain those bird populations uh, in this area. And we also have golden rods, which attract monarch butterflies. So that's another, um, another cool wildlife that you can see here. So I mentioned um, also that this is a, a pretty significant historical site. And that's because the, the Boston Post Road district uh, is made up by the Marshlands Conservancy and a number of other properties, including the Jay Estate. The Jay Estate is the boyhood home of founding father John Jay. Um, and uh, the, the, excuse me, the Jay Heritage Center, uh, who provided these images, have done an excellent job of maintaining and kind of like uncovering and maintaining and sharing the, the history and the stories of the people who lived in this estate, not just the Jays, but also the people who in, were enslaved there and the emancipated African Americans who lived there. So this estate is actually um, considered a National Historic Landmark, which fun fact, um, of, of the National Historic Landmarks, about 10% of them uh, are in New York State of all the nation, uh, but this is one of them. And this is also um, part of the Westchester um, African American Heritage uh, Trail. This is a stop at that trail. So uh, just to show you around a little bit, here's the Martians Conservancy. You can see the diversity in ecosystems here, the marsh and, and, the, and the shore and all of that. If you zoom in here, this right here is the Jay Estate. And if you zoom out a little bit, right over here is the Edith G. Reed National Natural Park and Wildlife Sanctuary. And uh, that's also a very nice place to visit. And G. Reed, along with Marshlands Conservancy, together make up one of our stewardship areas. So next up, we have Flax Pond. There we go. Flax Pond, it, Flax Pond is in Old Field, New York. Um, it's a 135 acre salt marsh, and it was purchased from the Settlequat tribe in around the 1600s, I believe slightly before 1659. And originally it was called Fresh Pond because indeed it was a freshwater pond. It was a commons and it was used to water cattle um, and to soak flax before it was to be made into linen. Now, once that flax industry uh, stopped being lucrative, 
uh, it was decided that the area would be turned uh, in, into for use into shell fishing. And so in 1803, an inlet was opened uh, connecting the pond with the brackish waters of Long Island Sound. So as that brackish water came in and mixed with the fresh water, it formed the conditions needed for there to be a salt marsh that we have today. Eventually, oysters and clams started colonizing the area and there was a pretty successful um, shellfishing industry that actually went on until relatively recently. Um, and in 1947, stone jetties were placed at, on either side of the inlet to help stabilize it a little bit. And I'll show you that on the map uh, shortly. Also close to uh, Flax Pond is the Child's Mansion, which is this house that you see right here. Um, it's a three-story house. Nowadays, it's owned by Stony Brook University, and it's mostly used for um, hosting meetings and for guest speakers and things like that. But parts of this house uh, are, date back to the 1700s, so it's, it's, it's a pretty beautiful sight to see from the outside. Um, and also in this area is the Stony Brook Marine Lab at Flax Pond. Um, and they conduct a lot of research in this area. So this is also a really valuable scientific area. And it allows for students to have on the field classes and experiences. So that's um, a pretty cool um, resource there. Now, something I want to mention is that uh, at the moment, the Marine Lab is undergoing construction. And when you visit the site, where you would park is the Marine Lab parking lot. So that's just something to keep in mind um, as you visit. Now the activities allowed here uh, include hunting for waterfowl, uh, paddling and hiking, although I, I wouldn't call it hiking, it's more a nature walk, it's very easy trails. And uh, this, uh, this area is actually free uh, free to go to. It's, it's open access um, as long as you have a permit. It's pretty easy to get the permit. You just visit uh, the DC website for Flex Bond. Um, it's a permit that you download and you put it on your dash and it's very simple. So once you have your permit printed and on the on the dash of your card, uh, you park at the marine lab, you follow the trail and the trail walks you through through the marshland and eventually to this bridge that you see here that crosses part of the pond, then goes further into the marsh and all the way out to the beach. So it's a pretty beautiful walk. Um, the marsh uh, is considered by DEC to be a, um, uh, excuse me, an important coastal uh, fish and wildlife area. And um, bird life is really abundant here. It's, it's not uncommon to see short-eared owls and um, least tern and common tern and, and, and things like that, um, red-shouldered hawk. Um, and it also houses a variety of wildlife. Um, in fact, at low tide, uh, if you are at the bridge and look down, you, what you'll see is a sea of fiddler crabs. So it's a really nice place to go. Um, it also is a common nursing, uh, not nursing, nesting uh, spot for horseshoe crabs. Uh, so I've included this video of a terrapin uh, d uh, digging its nest. So this is, this is actually in West Meadow Beach, which is a couple of miles from here. Um, but, but both West Meadow Beach and Flax Pond are also uh, common terrapin nesting sites. And uh, in fact, the Friends of Old uh, excuse me, Friends of Flax Pond, uh, the organization that helped protect the, the area, uh, annually hosts monitoring events with volunteers to help keep track of the nesting sites and the turtles coming here to nest. So if you're interested, that is another way to get involved. So from there, we can dive a little deeper. And here we see it looks like a, an educational group there. But here we're in the salt marsh. Here we see the flax pond itself. There are properties on the other side over there. And over here is a, a, a bridge to, to cross that pond. Now this bridge is, has been renovated. This is not the one that's there now. But a fun fact about this area is that uh, back in the day when the child's family still lived in the mansion, there was a 
a miniature replica of the Brooklyn Bridge in this area that supported tracks to a little tramway that they used to go from the estate to the, to the beach. Um, so un unfortunately, that's not here anymore. It was uh, destroyed in the 1938 hurricane, uh, but it's an interesting little fact. And before we go on to the next one, I just wanted to point out the jetties right here that you can see right there. So finally, our last stop for today is the Wildwood State Park in w a Wading River. So this is a 700, excuse me, 727 acre uh, park. It's mostly undeveloped hardwood forest, but as you can see, it also has a very nice waterfront that has been here for a long time, open to the public. And there's a number of activities available to do here, including camping. Uh, there's also newly opened cabins, I believe, um, fishing, swimming, hiking, paddle boarding. There's a picnic area, there's playgrounds, there's uh, opportunity to bike, etc. Uh, now, the, the shores of this park are about 15 acres wide, and that provides safety to the coast from storm surge. So that's value there. Uh, this right here is a bluff habitat. If, if you are familiar with the North Shore, you probably might have seen it. This is uh, relatively common in parts of the North Shore of Long Island. But something to know is that this is a really rare habitat in the U.S. as a whole, so it's pretty nice that we have it here. Now, apart from the beaches, another attraction uh, that brings people here are the miles and miles of trails that exist within the park, and a number of them make their way up the bluff and actually allow you to walk on the edge of the bluff. Uh, here's another view of, of from on top. It's, it's been described as a very scenic uh, hike, and um, it, it's really very beautiful. A couple of warnings though. Um, number one, be careful with ticks. And I can say that about any of the parks that I've talked about. Uh, the DEC website has more information about how to deal with ticks if you go hiking. Um, another, uh, another warning, like I said, a lot of the trails go really near the, on the edge of the bluff, so just be mindful of that and be careful as you're hiking. And it's best to just take a buddy uh, to this forested areas, but it really is a beautiful place. So finally, um, an interesting uh, element to this park that makes it very unique is that it contains a maritime beach forest. And um, this is actually an extremely rare ecosystem globally speaking. But um, it's it, so first of all, beach refers to American beach, the, tr the species of tree. And what makes it rare is not the, the tree itself, but rather that the tree is here. Um, so American beach is a pretty common uh, tree in the eastern United States, but it's not so common for it to be in a coastal environment. So when you visit this, this maritime beach forest, you'll notice that the, the trees are a little bit shorter than they usually would be. Their, their branches are contorted in, in kind of weird shapes, and this is due to the, the salt spray that they have to endure. But this is a natural community that has been found in Long Island that has adapted to this uh, sort of environment. So it's a, it's a fascinating place. And again, it's extremely rare on a global scale. So that uh, concludes our tour. Uh, like I said, I have a number of pins here, and uh, but this is by no means an exhaustive uh, list. Uh, but now, um, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer uh, any uh, at this time. Let's stop sharing. So, um, again, if you have a question that you would like to voice, you can uh, click to uh, raise your hand and you can be uh, you can be unmuted. Okay. Hi, Hi Amanda, it's Nancy. Great job. That was really fun to travel there with you. Um, 
but I wanted to ask you, um, I was surprised to hear that you need a DEC permit uh, for that one spot and thought that seemed very odd. I don't know what the purpose of that is. And is there any effort among any of these areas to control the number of people that access them? Because um, it didn't seem like it. And I, I don't have the impression that there are lots of visitors. Um, so I think I'll hand this over to Vicki shortly, um, but my impression is that uh, the permit is because it's a salt marsh and it's the area is owned by DEC, so that's the reason for the permit, I believe. Um, and in terms of controlling people, I, my impression is that it has depended based on the park. Uh, for example, that, that uh, Halleck State has only one trail open, that doesn't necessarily limit the amount of people walking there. I haven't, um, I haven't seen a lot of other efforts. In the website, they do give information about social distancing and things like that. Uh, but that, that is what I know. Vicki, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think permit is a little off-putting of a word, but it's really, yeah. I think it's the way the state, you know, it's a state-owned property with mixed use, like Jimena was saying that, you know, many of our state properties allow for hunting and fishing. Um, so in order to manage, as you say, manage properties, um, this is one way to do it, to just ask folks to please check in before you go so we know who is using the property and how often it's getting used and what kind of activity people are doing on the property. Because there isn't like, you know, when you go to a state park, you have a check-in booth, right? And so they know you're there, they know what you're going to do but some of these state properties don't have that. So this is one way to manage the site. Okay, thanks. I would just add to that too. This is Casey, sorry. I would just add that, yeah, that, that like Vicki said, I think that the word permit is a bit off-putting, but it's, it's really not a difficult thing. And, and I think, um, I, I don't know this 100%, but I, I think the DEC also might use it just to get an idea of tracking of how people are using the um, state-owned properties because that's true for a lot of the state-owned properties you're supposed to do that but it is very easy you go online um, you it's a downloadable PDF you fill out a couple questions to ask you about your permit or ask you about the activities you're gonna do and then you just print it off and put it in your windshield and then you also it'll automatically submit so that you're kind of submitting an email about hey I'm going here and I'm gonna do these activities and and also I would say I think the hunting type activities, the permit, they ask you to do it yearly. But if you're just visiting, those permits are good for three years. So you only have to do it once, you know, but it's just to get an idea, I think, of what people are doing on the different state properties. You know, I was just interested because um, I can understand certainly for the hunting and the different activities, but if you're out and you come across it or you find out about it and you decide to go there on a spur of the moment kind of situation, you know, obviously then you you'd be disappointed. Right, yeah. I don't, in my experience, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't know how enforced that is, right? Like we encourage people to do that, okay. but definitely been to sites where people don't have, you know, a sheet in their window. And I don't think there's people going around and necessarily checking it a whole bunch. Thanks. I, 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 you, in other words, I don't think you'd be prohibited from entering if you didn't I know understand. about yeah thanks i just put the link to that um the website for, on new york state dec where you can look at the details on getting access to state properties um where the the permit is um and there's also a question in the chat from lane um he wanted to know if there's a link to the map Pamena. yeah uh thank you lane let me just um let me just mute uh, nancy well, never mind. I'm not sure how to do that. <laughs> Apologies. I'm learning about this technology. Um, okay, I muted myself. Okay, thank you. Um, Lane, yes, I can, I, I'd be happy to um, provide a link to uh, the map. Uh, are there any other questions or comments or anything that anyone would like to share? Okay, it doesn't look like there are. So I guess we can wrap this up with that. Um, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us today. Thank you, Vicki and Casey uh, for joining me in Estuary Day. 
and um, have a great day, everyone. Happy exploring.